understand God's control. They're only concerned about their own control in life. Hang with me. I'm going somewhere here. This man was like that. He did not fear God. The Bible says also, <clears throat> neither regarded man. He didn't care about the, even the opinions of men. Okay? And the verse 3, it says, And there was a widow in that city. Say, a widow. And she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of my adversary. She's not saying to the judge, Revenge me. She's not saying, I want revenge. She's saying, I want you to avenge me. What she's saying, that's right. She says, I want justice. You're the judge. I need justice. I've got an adversary. And I need you to bring justice to my situation. She's not asking this judge for revenge. She's simply asking this judge to do what he was supposed to do. And that is... Minister Justice. Are y'all with me? That's his job. But he ignores that widow. Ignores her need. Who is this widow here? I'm more concerned about taking the cases of other people. You know, I forget her. You understand what I'm trying to show you here? And she's coming for justice. And this judge is unjust. He doesn't fear God. Nor does he, as the scripture says, regard man. And the Bible says, verse 4, <clears throat> he would not for a while, which means he totally ignored this widow. Okay, this is in connection with prayer. It says, he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, though I fear not God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me. You with me? I will avenge her, lest by her continual, say continual. So now we found out something else about prayer. Not only is prayer essential and necessary and a necessity to not faint, then prayer must be continual. Say with me, continual. Continual. This widow is by her continual coming. She is wearying this judge. Are y'all awake? Literally, the word weary means bruise. This widow is bruising this judge. She, let me put it this way. This widow is causing this judge some pain. Because she won't give up. She refuses to quit. She keeps going back. The judge said, I don't have time to see her today. She goes back the next day. Judge says, I don't have time to see her today. She goes back the next day. And on and on and on and on this goes. Judge says, I don't have time for her today. And she keeps going back, and she will not quit until she gets an audience with that judge. And it's wearing him out. It's bruising him. This widow keeps coming up. So he's going to take care of her, try to help her for his sake. So that she'll leave him alone. I'm, get her in here. I am so sick and tired. Just get her in here right now. I'm going to deal with her because I'm tired. I really don't care if she gets justice or, or not. I'm just tired of her coming knocking on my door. You with me? And I see that it's not going to do me any good to ignore her. I see that she is persistent. I see that it's going to be continual. I see that if I don't help her, she's going to keep coming till I do help her. And this is the way you and I are to be in prayer. You say, it must be essential, but it must be continual. Constant. Listen. What he said. And the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge saith. He's an unjust judge. He's ungodly. He's not saved. He doesn't know God. He doesn't fear God. He doesn't even care what people think. He said, but hear what the unjust judge is trying to teach you. He said, I'm going to take this example and I'm going to use it to teach my church. Hear what the unjust judge saith. In contrast, you have a heavenly father. Who 
is not ignoring you. You have a heavenly father who will not ignore you. You have a heavenly father that is not unjust. You have a heavenly father that is just. You don't have a heavenly father that doesn't care about God's authority. God cares about his own authority. Listen to me. If he don't answer prayer, it undermines his authority. He's, listen, he's bound himself to answer prayer. If he doesn't answer prayer, he undermines his own godness. So we have a contrast here. Watch what he said. And shall not God, look at this, avenge his own elect, which cry day and night, look at that, day and night, continual prayer, day and night, unto him, though he bears long with them. It says God is long-suffering with you. You cry and you pray unto God, God is going to hear your prayer. He wants to hear your prayer. He's not like the unjust judge. There's a contrast here. If the unjust judge could be moved to action by the continual coming of this widow to him, God is saying how much more God will answer your prayer if you'll come to him because he's not an unjust judge. Come on. He's not going to ignore you. Are y'all here right now? He's your father. And the Bible says he will answer them speedily. So when you come to God, you don't need to look at God as an unjust judge who's reluctant to answer your prayer. You need to look at God as your heavenly father. He's your father. He's not unjust. He wants to answer your prayer. So here's the, here's the awesome thing about it. He says, if you pray, you're going to get the results. But he's telling you it's essential, it's necessary, but it must be done continually. Then he says, I'm going to answer you speedily. Then why does he say you've got to keep praying continually? It's not to overcome his reluctance. It is because you're not going to always get it the way you want it. And so the problem is when you're praying, God, would you do it this way? You don't get it that way. You stop praying. God wants you to understand that he's your heavenly father. He knows what's best for you. He knows what's best for me. And if I'll keep praying, he's going to answer it speedily. It might not just be the way I want it answered. But he's not going to ignore me. He's not unjust. Come on, are y'all here? He's a good God. He's my heavenly father. <clears throat> And he always answers prayer. There's not one prayer that you have ever prayed or I've ever prayed that God didn't answer. Not one. Some of you say, God didn't answer my prayer. Yes, he did. Because it is impossible for God not to answer prayer. It's impossible. It would undermine his own authority. Come on. So when you're, when you're going through a time, and you experience the unjust conditions of the world around you. You're being treated unjustly by this world. Go to your heavenly father who cares about you and will answer you speedily. He, come on, he answered every prayer you ever prayed. You say, well, he didn't answer mine. Yes, he did. Well, I didn't see it. You didn't see it the way you wanted it. But he still answered it. Are y'all with me? See, this is, you got to walk by faith when you pray. See, God, was, he answers every prayer. Sometimes he says, yes. Sometimes he says, no. And then sometimes he says, wait. Now's not the time. Come on. So that's what we need to understand. We got to keep praying because we don't know. Maybe, you know, God is telling us to wait. And uh, sometimes he's not going to do it the way we want it. But he always answers prayer. He's a good God. And you're going you're gonna to be coming up against unjust situations and unjust people. Let me put it this way. Just absolute jerks in your life. 
Okay? That's what this widow was facing. But when you go to God, he's not like that. He's good. Your sons. He's your father on that relationship. You walk in there boldly, unashamed, with importunity. And God is ready to answer your prayer. He's ready to answer my prayer. And so when we go in the prayer room, you know, you got to, you know what? You got to keep praying and continue because you got to get rid of doubt. You got to get rid of your reluctance. <laughs> you got to get rid of your unbelief. Come on, somebody. That's what you got to overcome. You got to overcome self. You got to overcome the darkness. You got to overcome demonic powers. You got to overcome things that are in opposition to the will of God in your life. So you got to keep pushing it through. But the problem does not reside with God. God loves you. And He answered every prayer. So this is His promise. This is His promise. So if that's the case, then why aren't we praying more? Understand? Why are we going through life trying to handle everything on our own, barely making it spiritually? When we've got a God like that, a Father like that, He has, well, somebody said, well, why don't He just do it automatically then? Why do we have to pray? Why don't He just do it for us? Sometimes He does. Even when you don't pray, He's still good. Sometimes He does. But sometimes He doesn't move until you pray because He has limited Himself. God has chosen to limit himself to your prayer on this planet. Come on. If you want things to happen in this planet, in this earth realm, then you've got to pray. That's a law of God. God operates by laws that he has set in on himself. So he's limited himself to move except by prayer. Are y'all with me? On certain things. So he's letting you know. When you've got all kind of injustice coming against you, are y'all with me? Like this unjust judge, end time situations, very difficult and hard to live, Spiritual, spirituality, you know what I'm talking about, come on. He said, this is the key. You understand who your God is. And you understand he's not like that. And when you're facing the injustice, and you're facing this, 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 you know what I'm saying, impossible situation. Looking at a jerk in the face. He said, you know what? You go to God and don't see God that way. God is not a jerk. Are y'all with me today? God wants to hear your prayer. Oh, hallelujah to the Lamb. You're not careful. Listen, I've been there. You start going through things and you're, you're uh, experiencing injustices at the hands of people. Then you'll start seeing God that way. But God is trying to tell you, I'm not like that. I'm not like that injustice you're facing right now. Don't get mad at God. Don't get angry at God. Don't get bitter at God. Friend, he, listen, he gave you the greatest opportunity to connect with divinity, deity, to intervene into your life and mine. What a great, wonderful God we have. He said, you can talk to deity. You can talk to God and move God. You can move God. If a widow can move an unjust judge, what will God do for his children? He said, I'll move for my children. God has given you access to God. You get that. So it's not the problem with God. It's the problem with our flesh. We're, we get weary, we get tired, our bodies are tired, our minds are tired, you know, and all that that's going on. We've got to overcome a lot of things. And so, as he's saying, he wants you to know what kind of God he is when it comes to prayer. He wants to hear our prayer. And he's letting you know if you don't pray, you're going to faint because you're not going to have the strength that you need to make it in the last days. But if you pray, you will not faint. Look at your neighbor and tell, tell him, if you pray, you will not faint. And if you're feeling like fainting right now, you feel like you don't have any more strength. You don't know if you could go on anymore. I, God has God himself, not this pastor, 
but God himself has just now given you a key. What do you need to do? You need to get in a place of prayer until you can walk out of that place and say, you know what? I'm renewed. I've renewed my strength like the eagles. I have fed upon the body of Christ. And I've got my strength back. Hallelujah. I got vision. I got vision. I'm like an eagle. I got his eye. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm able to talk. I got his tongue. I got his heart. I got his passion back. And I don't have time to get on that, but I've been feeding on the body of a crucified Christ, risen from the dead. And so now I've got power, and I've got vision, and I've got passion inside because of the power of prayer. Let me tell you, this message I'm preaching today is a prayer sent up unto God. That's why right now, as I'm preaching, I'm energized. That's why as I'm preaching, I'm anointed. Because even the preaching is a prayer unto God. Your praise is a prayer unto God. Your worship is a prayer unto God. Your testimony is a prayer unto God. Your whole life is worship. It's not what you do. It's your lifestyle. Come on, somebody. And this is the kind of God we serve. He's so wonderful. You imagine... You know, if you're a parent, you say, why don't my kids talk? How heartbroken you would be and never hear from your kids. How, how just devastating. But they, with the love that you've got for your children, and they don't even have time to talk. It's devastating. God is saying, He wants a relationship with us, He's not reluctant. Wants to hear his children, sons, Jim. He wants to hear everybody in this church come and pray, and seek his face, especially in these last days. And if we do it, we're gonna get the strength we need. We're gonna make it. Come on, we're gonna have an awesome relationship with this God. We won't get religious if you're not praying. You're getting religious. If we're not praying, we're getting self righteous. I'm telling you, the more we pray, the more humble we are. The more we pray, the more we see our need to pray. The more we pray, the more we see who we are. We're not praying, we're getting more self-righteous. We're not praying, we're getting more religious. Are y'all hearing me? We might be doing more things, but are we praying? The relationship must be there. So he's not like this unjust judge who fears not God nor regards me. God regards me. He regards you. He regards, he didn't have to, but he regards you and he regards me. He takes notice of you. He's mindful of you. His mind is full of you. What is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest him. God says, I'm mindful of you. He don't just regard you. Not only does he not ignore you, he's full. You're in his mind to fullness. He's full. His mind is full of you, man. He's thinking of you all the time. And why don't they talk to him? And look at him. Trying to survive, struggle for life. Look at him trying to do it on their own. But all they got to do is pray. But you see that old pride, that old flesh, says, I can do it. I can strong, I'm strong enough. I don't need God. I don't need the church. I don't even need to go to church. I don't need to pray. Oh, friend, you don't know. You don't know how important it is to be in the house of God. You don't know how important it is to worship God and to pray. You don't know how important it is. You'll never make it in this life spiritually. And I, I really realize, I'm telling you this. Jesus talked about things that are acceptable things. Eating and drinking, marrying and giving to marriage. And, you know, it, he talked about things that are uh, normal living. But he said, don't let that get in the way of your spirituality. 
can I tell you something? Legitimate things steal your walk. Because you start prioritizing the things in the natural above the things of the spirit. So you know what? I better do this instead of go to church. I better do this instead of pray. I'm going to tell you something. Well, I don't think God will be upset about that. It seems to be like a legitimate need to me. You better talk to God before you do it. Because it might not be legitimate enough to Him. God will understand, won't He, Pastor? I don't know. My family's got a need, Pastor. Won't God understand? I don't know if He'll understand. Where do you put Him in your life? Is He number one? Is He number one priority? Or is there somebody else that you put in front of God? And I'm talking about legitimate things. Legitimate things. God's telling us in these, this teaching of last, last Sunday, the last day. He says it's going to be like the days of Noah. Eating and drinking, merrily giving. You know? The days of Lot, they were planting, building, and eating and drinking. All these things are legitimate things. All of a sudden, unprepared. The end time caught them by surprise. Called me on the phone, Pastor. Is it okay if I miss church? You're probably going to get dead silence for a minute. I'm going to tell you, you're probably going to get dead silence for a minute. You know why? Because we have yet to come to an understanding of how important church is and how important God's Word is and how important it is to have a relationship with God. Come on, are y'all with me right now? So many of things that we try to take care of if we just go to church and pray and worship God, God would take care of them. Hallelujah. I said God would take care of us. God can do more by prayer than you can do in 30 days or 30 years on your own by prayer. You waste your time. Are you here? Now, God, now here's what you saying, Pastor. I'm telling you this. Is that before you do something legitimate, talk to God about it. If God says it's all right, then do it. You're not going to have a problem with me. My problem with you is going to be, have you talked to God about it before you did it? Legitimate. Yeah. Did you talk to God? Did he tell you not to go to church? Did he tell you you didn't have to pray? See, we don't realize that if we were to measure our spiritual strength today, all it would take maybe is giving your attention to one legitimate thing that keeps you away from the most important God. All it could take is one, one time, and you lose your strength completely. Where are you? If we could meter it, if we could gauge it, where are we today? And we got enough strength to take that legitimate thing and put it in the place of God. Do it. That's why we got to talk to God. We must pray. So I'm telling you, in the light of the last days, and what he said about Lot and what he said about Noah, he said, Remember Lot's wife? She started out right, but she didn't finish. She put forth effort, but she didn't have enough. To go all the way to the mountain. So I'm telling you, in the, in the context of this, it's not just about prayer, but it's talking about the last days. 18, not 15. Get all the way. I'm not. Okay. Go on. I'll let the Word of God and the Spirit of God do its work. I'm going to try to keep me out of this. Okay? I'm going to let God talk. Telling you. But I just have to. Who told you? Who told you you had to. Did you? Interfered with your prayer. What do we do? I will tell you something, man. You know what I'm talking about. I have so much to preach this morning. I got I got five weeks worth of preaching to preach in one service. I don't know if I'm gonna make it, but I'm gonna tell you something. It's an impossible salvation without prayer. You look at your neighbor, you tell them it is an impossible salvation without prayer. It 
It's essential. And it must be. Y'all believe that? Believe it. I believe what Jesus said. I believe it. I don't just have an intellectual belief. I really believe it. When I read it, I don't just read it just to get facts to put in my brain. When, I, when, she, when God, when Jesus says it, I'm putting it down in here. I'm not just putting it up here in my brain, my mind. I believe what he said. Got to pray, are you? But if I will pray, I won't faint. Isn't that beautiful? What an awesome promise that is. So get to, get to the place of prayer. Get your strength. Get your walk back. Hallelujah. Verse 7, shall not God avenge? He's going to give you justice. And not just justice, mercy. Justice in relationship to human beings. But mercy in relationship to God. God will avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them. God is long-suffering with us. Aren't you thankful God, God's long-suffering? He's so long-suffering. When I'm ready to give up on myself, God said, I'm not done. Go pray. You ever been in a place where you feel like just giving up on yourself? You know what God says? Go pray. And you'll find a long-suffering God in that prayer room or that prayer closet. You'll find a long-suffering God. And you'll walk out of there and you thought, man, I just feel like giving up on myself. But I just met God. And I found out that God bears long with me. That He's long-suffering. Doesn't give me a license of sin because I sure didn't like the way I was feeling. I sure was feeling miserable and empty. I don't want to feel like that. But thank God I didn't quit. Found out that God's still, still bearing with me. He's still long suffering. This is the kind of God He is. I love Him for that, don't you? I said, I love Him for that. I love Him for that. I thank God for that. I love him for that. I want to quit on myself. I want to quit on you. Here's the good news. You want to quit on me. God still loves you. You're, you're looking at I'm real honest, man. That's why the pastor. I tell you, I'm honest with you. I don't play this game. I'm telling you, man, that we need God. And God is there for us. He's there for you. And he's there for me. And you know why he's there? Because of the blood that he shed on Calvary. Not because you deserve it or I deserve it. It's because of the blood of Jesus Christ. It was an impossible salvation. It was impossible for us to have a relationship with God. It was impossible for you to be able to pray to God. It was impossible for him to be long-suffering with you. But because of the blood. This is a blood church. Look at your neighbor and say the blood. This is a blood church. This is a Jesus name church. This is a blood church. So in prayer, I go to God in prayer, not because I'm trying to justify my own self. I got to stand before God and say the blood. I got to say, be merciful to me, a sinner. This is the way I'm coming, God. I need you, God. I'm desperate. I understand my great need for a Savior. I understand my need for the blood. So Jesus goes into the next parable. He spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves. That's why I say if we're not praying, it's a true mark of identity. Of self righteousness. Trusted in himself. Now look, he spoke the first one <clears throat> to his disciples. With me? And remember, this angry religious group of people still around. These self righteous Pharisees and scribes that thought because of their own righteousness that they were on their way to heaven and that they had a hotline straight to God. If anybody's hearing God, it's got to be the, you know, if God's hearing anybody, it's got to be the Pharisee, right? And 
So now he speaks this parable. He's fixing to make everybody mad. Oh, I'm talking about the religious people, the church. He's fixing to make the church mad. He's going to talk to a bunch of self-righteous people, Pharisees, okay, that trust in themselves. <clears throat> he speaks this parable, of, he said, unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Say self-righteousness. And they despised others. That literally means they put others out. All right? Now watch. This is heavy. Say self-righteousness. These people are not saved. They're religious. They don't know God, but they go to church. They are self-good. They're good in their own eyes. They're righteous in their own eyes, but they don't even know God. Hello? And I'm not, that's not you. Because you've believed in the blood. You have embraced Jesus Christ, but they are rejecting. Watch this. The key to this whole thing is an impossible salvation. So, he gives them this parable. He said, two men went up into uh, the temple to pray, and one a Pharisee, the other a publican. That old despised public. Right? <clears throat> With me? Tax collector. Hated, despised tax collector. IRS. Who didn't just collect legitimately and legally the tax that was due. He robbed his own people. When he collected taxes for the Roman government, he charged a lot of money on top of the tax. On top of the tax. And he put the money on top of the tax in his own pocket. And he gave the tax to the government. Okay? So he was hated, man. He'd rip off his own people. He was, he was looked at as the worst of sinners. The worst of sinners. <clears throat> and he walked in the temple that day, the publican did. The worst of sinners. And here comes this self-righteous religious man who walked into the temple too. Now both of them, where'd they go? They both went to church. <coughs> Let's say the temple. <coughs> the Bible says we'll say the church. So you know. Said. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. You're going to see personal pronoun. We'll just call him personal pronoun, pronoun man. I would call him Republican, but we call him personal pronoun man. He is preoccupied with his own self. In fact, he's praying to himself, not to God. <laughs> he goes into the temple of the church and he starts telling God how good he is. That's right. Really, he's praying to himself, not to God. He's going in there to self justify. And the Bible says, and are y'all with me still? The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself God, I thank thee. I thank you, God, for what? That I am not as other men are. Look at him, breaking his arm, patting himself on the back. I'm not an extortioner, I'm not unjust, I'm not an adulterer, or even this publican. And that's the way that, that Pharisee walked into church that day. He started pointing fingers. Look at him. I'm glad I'm not like that man over there. I'm glad I'm not an extortioner. I'm glad I'm not a publican. I'm glad I'm not an adulterer. Come on. You know, he said, I fast twice a week, <clears throat> twice in the week. 
Now, that doesn't mean you fast two days. You probably give a couple meals. I mean, you're going to really build it up, though. I fast twice a week. I don't know. Maybe he did fast two days. I fast twice in a week. Look at this. I, again, I give tithes of all. I, I possess, are you with me? Of all that I possess, right? Look at that. He is so preoccupied with himself and his own goodness, and he doesn't even know God. He's religious, but he doesn't know God. He goes to church, but he doesn't know God. He has an intellectual understanding of the Bible, but he doesn't know God. How many people have an intellectual understanding of that Bible, but they've never been born again of the water and the Spirit? They've been raised in church. They've been going to church all their lives. They could quote that Bible frontwards, backwards, upside down. They could tell you they, their, their, their commitment to tithing and offerings and their commitment to going to church. And they could tell you they've never committed adultery and they've never been an extortioner and they're, not a, they're for sure not a public. But that doesn't mean they know God. You can have an intellectual understanding of God and be lost. It's an impossible. And you say, man, I know that man. Say, look at him. He can quote the Bible. He's a preacher behind the pulpit. He's got to know. Intellectual knowledge of God does not save you. And you're going to squirm like a worm this morning. Because that's the truth. Let me let you in on something. This man he's talking about is one of the most dedicated separatists you could ever find intellectual giant these Pharisees were memorization of scripture that would put every one of us to shame in this house but still did not know God faithful to pray but did not know God faithful in giving but did not know God he's trying to come on the grounds of his own goodness an impossible, impossible salary. It is impossible for you, by your good works of going to church or in any religious exercise, to be saved. It is impossible. Even if you live a good life, so to speak, it's still impossible for you to be saved. I said you to be saved it is impossible with man it's impossible with me it's impossible with you to be saved oh wow I'm going somewhere impossible this is what God's going to show you in this that's why he's saying this before right before he goes into Jerusalem he wants you to get this it is impossible with man to be saved you can try by getting religious. You can try by going to church. You can try by bringing your tithes. You can try by reading your Bible. You can try by having intellectual knowledge of God. You can try all of these religions. But it's impossible for you to be saved. It's an impossible salvation. You can go your hair and never cut it. You can wear your dress, ladies, at just the right length. You men can say no to every, everything that's related to pornography. You can say no to it. Come on. You can say no to snuff. You can say no to drugs. You can say no to alcohol. You can say no to all of that, and you can still die and go to hell. Because this is an impossible salvation with you. Man, see, so Jesus picked the, the man who was the most religious in his day. You know, 
and he compared it with a publican. All right, watch. I'm going slow here. One of them mornings, you know? Watch. <clears throat> and verse 13, and the publican, say the publican. <clears throat> oh, God, despicable human being. This despicable man. With me? He doesn't even, even deserve to be in the temple. He doesn't even need to be standing. He doesn't even deserve to be even in the same atmosphere of this Pharisee. That would be the Pharisees. That's what he said. Public. Let I'm not like him, God. Y'all away. Beautiful, isn't it? Not the Pharisee. It's his tension the nostrils of God. That self righteousness. I don't have time. So I go to the prophet Isaiah. He said it is as filthy rags. Your self-righteousness is as filthy rags in the eyes of God. Because it creates an arrogance and a pride. You think you know God just because you went to church. He said self-righteousness. Your, he said your righteousness. Your righteousness. You, man, your righteousness is as filthy rags in the sight of God. You know what? Now, I, I don't want to embarrass you today, but that word filthy rags, you know what kind of rag he's talking about? He's talking about a minstrel cloth in Isaiah. He said our self-righteousness is like a minstrel cloth in the eyes of God. That's heavy. That's the way God looks at it. When we come in here and we try to approach God, God, uh, God on our own goodness. Now, I'm talking about in reference to salvation. With you, it's impossible. Brother Mark, it's impossible for you to be saved. It's impossible for me to be saved. Hold on. I'm going somewhere here with this. With man, it is impossible. So you can try. You say, I'm going to clean up my life. I'm going to stop doing this. And I'm going to start doing this. And all of this, you know. And I'm going to start going to church. And I'm going to turn over a new leaf. And I'm going to make a New Year's resolution. I'm not going to drink anymore. Smoke it. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to clean my tie. I'm going to start taking my family to church. I'll be lost. This publican, though, says, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God. Now notice, both of them started out the same way. Both of them said, God. They both started out the same way in their prayer. With God on their lips. But as they progressed, one was really praying with himself, talking to God about how good he was. The other man's a publican standing afar off, and he says to God, But what does he say to God? Be merciful to me, a sinner. Oh, hello. <clears throat> this publican. This despicable human being, this tax collector, this filthy man, sinner, comes into the presence of God and says, be merciful to me. God, a sinner. Now, you don't catch this, but I'm going to tell you what's there. He says, be to me the mercy seat. He's not just asking God for mercy. He's asking God to be the mercy seat where the blood was applied that turned God's throne from a throne of wrath and judgment 
to a throne of mercy. That throne had God's commandments, the law in it. The holy, righteous requirements of God to man was in the ark. And on top of that ark was the mercy seat. And if there was no blood on the mercy seat, if you walked in there, you would die by the holiness of God. His law condemned you, and His holiness condemned you. As soon as you walked in there, you would have been a dead man. So they took the blood of animals, and they sprinkled it on the mercy seat. Seven times before it and seven times on it. Seven times before the veil, I should say, and seven times before the mercy seat. They applied the blood there. Jesus bled seven places. And this publican is standing there and he's not justifying himself. He says, I need a Savior. It's impossible for me to be saved. I need a Savior. He's saying, God, look at this. I want you to see it. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He's saying, God, become the mercy seat. Become the, pro, the, the propitiation for me. Oh, I'm telling you, that's a Bible word. Propitiation is a Bible word. Propitiation. Propitiation means this. The offering that appeases the wrath of God. He said, God, when I stand in here, he said, I understand because of my sin, the wrath of God is on me. But he says, God, if you will become the mercy seat, then that means you will be propitiated. That means your anger will cease towards me. You will be propitiated. You will be, come on, are you all with me? Your anger, excuse me, will be appeased. Why? Because of the blood. This man is saying, I recognize it's an impossible salvation. I recognize that what that man is doing does not save him. I recognize my need for God. I recognize God must save me. If I'm to be saved, I know I can't save myself. I know if I'm to be saved, God is the only one that can do it. I know that it is impossible for me to save myself. Only God can save me. So God, I know right now I deserve your wrath. And I know I deserve your anger. And I know you're holy. But I know God, by the blood that was on that mercy seat, if you will be propitiated by that blood, you will not be angry with me anymore. Not because of my own goodness, but because of the blood that has been shed. A substitute has taken my place. This man had a revelation that he could not be saved on his own. That what is impossible with man is only possible with God. And he said, God, I don't know a lot about the Bible. But he said, I've got a revelation that God himself... It's going to become that mercy seat. God himself is going to become that propitiation. God himself. Jesus is going to make it possible. I said Jesus is going to make it possible. In fact, the book of Hebrews, I believe it's Hebrews 9. I don't know. You have to check it out. Hebrews 9, it calls Jesus the propitiation for your sin. He is the propitiation. He is the mercy seat. Jesus appeased God's wrath, which means God was satisfied with the work of the cross to the degree that he would stop being angry with you and I if he saw the blood. Now, I want you to see this. Look at the way this man speaks. He said, God... I need you to become that. I need you to become the propitiation. Now watch. I wish I had five hours. I may have to stop and finish this next week. Watch this. God is a God of love. We've already seen it in the first parable. He loves you. He wants fellowship with you. 
Are y'all with me? Now watch. But at the same time, this God of love is angry with sin. God then is going to be the one behind the satisfaction of his anger. I don't know if you get that. What's going to motivate God to be the one who satisfies his own anger is the love that he has for you. So because he loves you, because God loves you, he loves you while you were yet a sinner. He loved me while I was yet a sinner. But his holiness and his, his come on, his righteousness caused him to be angry with the sin that was in me. So what God did is he decided to propitiate his own anger. He decided to satisfy his own anger because of his love for you. And that was at the cross. He was not reluctant to die for you. And this man's got a revelation. If I'm to be saved, God must become the propitiation. God must satisfy his own self. Ooh. God must satisfy his own anger. And that's by blood. It's going to take death. That will satisfy the righteous indignation of God against sin. So this man's got a revelation of something that's so awesome. I pray you get it. That without God doing it, it is impossible for you and I to be saved. Because God is angry with the sinner every day. But his, that's his holiness. But his love that's in him is motivating him to satisfy his own anger by death and the shedding of blood. Are y'all? So this man is looking over in the tabernacle. In the, he's in the temple. He said, hey, God, I need you to become that lid that's on the ark. I need you to fulfill the type. Oh, are you getting this? <clears throat> Because I know that what this man has is not It is not. And he's got a revelation also that the blood of bulls and goats that was shed and put on that ark, he's got a revelation. The lamb that was killed that morning, that lamb was not enough. I don't know if you understand that. This man has more revelation as a publican than even the disciples did, I believe, at this point. He said, God, it's got to go higher than what I see in this temple. I need you, God, to become the fulfillment of your own type. I need you to save me, God. I need you to be the propitiation. I need you to satisfy your own anger. I need you to be the mercy seat. I need you to be the, the place where the blood is applied. Where the blood is shed. Uh -uh. Be merciful to me. A what? A sinner. You don't walk in there and say, oh God, I'm so good. You know, get your thumbs out, eat your thumb roll. Say, God, I'm a sinner and I know it. He didn't walk into church with an air about him. Got his nice new suit on. Look at me. I, I'm glad God's glad to be here. He walked in there. He threw his hands up in, in an altar service. And he said, I'll tell you what, God, I know who I am. And I know it's impossible for me to be saved. So I say to you, God, I'm a sinner. But he wouldn't even look up his eyes to heaven. Because he didn't even feel worthy to look up. He was so ashamed of his sin and his condition. He went so much to lift up his eyes to him. He said, God, I need you to be the I need you to be the propitiation, the satisfying of your own anger. I tell you, he said, this man, the publican, went or went down to his house justified rather than the other. 
For everyone that exalted himself shall be effaced, and he that humbled himself shall be exalted. This publican went down justified because he got a revelation of his need of God to save him. The other man went home religious, still with his religion. He went home unjustified, still holding on to his own good works. He went home lost that day from church because he didn't see his need for salvation. He thought it was possible for him to save himself. But the other man got a revelation. If I'm to be saved, only God, listen, only God and only God and only God can do it. Only God, not a second person, only God Not just a man, Christ Jesus, and not just the Spirit of God, but God in Christ reconciling the world to himself, God and man together. Are y'all with me? So he had a revelation. Only God can save me. Which means Jesus is more than just a man. He has to be more than a man. You with me? Jesus has to be God in order to save you. I said, why, why is it so important for us to have a revelation of the deity of Jesus, that Jesus is God? If you don't believe that Jesus is God, you cannot be saved. It is impossible. It is an impossible salvation for Jesus to save you if he is not absolutely God. It is an impossible salvation. So he said, God, be to me. Be merciful to me, a sinner. God, be the mercy seat. God, be the propitiation. God, well, how's God going to do that? It's impossible for God to do that because it takes blood to do it. How's God going to save man? Because God is a spirit and it takes blood. How can God become the mercy seat? How can God, are y'all with me? become the Savior? How can God propitiate his own self? How can God do that when he is a spirit? But this man's got a revelation that God will become personified. What that ark representing God will become. Y'all hang in it. Y'all awake? It is impossible for you to be saved. It is impossible for anybody on this planet to be saved. If Jesus is not God, he cannot be the second person. He must be God in order for you to be saved. And this is a revelation that the religious person did not have. This is a revelation that the Pharisee did not have. They have rejected the name of Jesus. They rejected Jesus. But this publican had a revelation that it was impossible for him to be saved. Are y'all aware? But he took it further and he said, God can do it. God can do it. Next incident. And they brought unto him also infants that he would touch them. Then when his disciples saw it, they rebuked him. Disciples rebuked them for bringing the children. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter therein. It is an impossible salvation if you do not become like a little child. Wow. That throws me into another dilemma. Because if it's impossible for you, it is impossible for man to be saved. That means also mankind includes little children. Hello? You mean to tell me that just because you're a baby, 
listen to me carefully. What is he saying? You're telling me, little Johnny, a child, who just got through cussing you out before you came to church. Who bit the head off of that frog yesterday. Just simply because he's younger of age, that that puts him in the kingdom? What is Jesus really saying here? Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again or you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So what he's doing here, he's bringing you an illustration of the new birth. You've got to enter in the kingdom like a newborn child. You must be born again or you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Your child needs saved. Your child needs the Holy Ghost. Your child needs to be baptized in Jesus' name. It's an impossible salvation. You must be born again. You've got to come to God like a child comes to God. You've got to come with simple faith. You've got to acknowledge God, Jesus is God, when religious people won't. Little children were coming to Jesus when the religious people weren't coming to Jesus. Are you getting this? They had a better judgment of who Jesus was than the most religious. Come on. I'll throw this in. You watch a man. You watch a man that children like to be around. Want to be around. I'm not. Listen to me. Listen. I'm not getting into this. I'm not talking strange stuff. You look at a man. Jesus was a man, but he was God. And children flock to him. They discern in Jesus something about him that the religious Pharisees had not discerned. Their judgment on Jesus was not opposition and hatred. They said, let me get to him. You, you show me a man that children like to be around. They have a better judgment of nature than grown people do. You show me a man that children like to be around, and that's a man I want to be around. <clears throat> because they discern what kind of spirit is in that man. That man doesn't even have to open his mouth. That child can discern the spirit that is in that man. And if they want to be around that man, I want to be around that man. Because there's something about that man that's right. And adults can be going crazy and don't have a clue. But a child can discern it. You give me a dog on a leash. And I can tell you what kind of man the person is. A child and a dog can discern real quick what kind of person. If I walk up with my dog, my dog likes to bark at everything. <clears throat> but I'm telling you, man walks up, she goes berserk on that man. I'm going to say, you know what? I think I'm going to stay away from you. There's some men, she'll bark at him, but she won't go crazy. There's some of them, boy, she's about to rip the gate off. I said, I'm watching you, both my eyes. Because a dog and a child they discern things from the nature of an individual. And these children were flocking to Jesus. That should have been an indication to those religious idiots that this was a man of God to say the least. That these children, man, they loved to be around Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. They were comfortable in the presence of the Lord. They, were, they, they, they enjoyed being around him. And you got those old snarling religious church. They 
should have looked at the children. She should have said, you know what? We should be like that. We should walk into him. There must be something about that. Could he be the Savior? Get it? But was it done? Children trying to see, trying to get to see the way a child responds to God. A child runs to God. Ultimately, saying, you have to be born again. It doesn't mean you're going to become a child all over again. I want you to understand this. You're going beyond natural. The religious man said, how can I be born again? Can I enter into my mother's womb and be born a second time? Jesus said, you missed the point. I'm not talking about natural birth. You must get that this morning. He's not just talking about natural birth here. He's talking about spiritual birth. You must be born again. Not go back in your mother womb and be born a second time naturally, but spiritually. Y'all get it? Now, I'm going to tell you that right there, it took me 25 years before I ever understood what this was talking about. 25. Because I used to work with that, mess with that. God, how am I supposed If I'm to enter in the kingdom of God, you said the only way to enter the kingdom of God is to be childlike. So how am I going to... What do I do? Do I get a child, look at them, and imitate everything they do, every way they talk? Mm-hmm. What is it about the child God that I must become like in order to get in your kingdom? That's him with them. You hear me? Oh, you great theologian. You must be born again, Lord. He's taking you beyond natural things. He's using natural things to illustrate, illustrate spiritual food. Give God praise. So you've got to get to Jesus like they got to Jesus. You've got to be saved by Jesus. You must be born again of the water and the spirit. You've got to be born from above. And then so he, go, he continues. Now, I'm going to get right to And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit? Here we go. Eternal life. Tell me what to do to inherit eternal life. Watch this. Notice he says, What shall I do? This is pretty serious. <clears throat> Heaven or hell depends on the answer. Where I spend eternity and where you spend eternity depends on the answer. So I'm gonna, I want to listen real close to what God is saying. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Watch. This man's a ruler. The young ruler. Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good save one. That is God. Uh oh. What he just told him was this You're going to have to have a revelation. Not that I'm good, but that I'm God. Because it's impossible for you to inherit eternal life. You. It's impossible with man. You've got to have a revelation that I'm more than just a good master. You must have a revelation of what, what I just said to you. There's only, only God is good. Watch. So what he's saying is this. If you call me good because God is the only one that's good, that means that I must be God. So you got to get a revelation, rich young ruler, rich young ruler, that I'm God. And you say I'm good, and the only way I could be good is if I was God. Watch. Your life then depends on this. Rich young ruler. Everybody in this church, your life depends on this. Is he God to you? He 
because he can't be a good master and not be God. You see where he's taking? Oh, this is so powerful. You are talking about possible salvation. Watch what this man does. <clears throat> Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. That means stop lying. Don't lie. Honor thy father and thy mother. And he said, All these have I kept from my youth up. I've kept the Ten Commandments. I've kept them from my youth. And I believe he did. I believe this man was absolutely, totally sincere. But he said, I've kept it. Are y'all with me? At least in his understanding of what those commandments meant, he kept them. Right? I'm not going to get into that a whole lot. But what he's trying to do is be safe based on the law of God. Obeying the Ten Commandments. That's what he's basing his eternal life on. That I haven't stolen, I haven't killed, I haven't committed adultery, etc., etc. The last six commandments are given here in relationship to man. To man. But what about the first four that's connected to God? They're not listed. Will you look at it with me? Will all the theologians look at it with me? Uh, it's written. Watch this. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. Are you with me? Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not, do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor thy mother. Anyway, I, all six are not listed here. But the last six of the Ten Commandments are related to man. But the first four commandments are related to God. The first four are connected to God. Last six are connected to your relationship with man. So these are connected to your relationship with man. He said, I kept them. But he didn't keep the first four in relationship to God. Woo. His life depends on his understanding that Jesus is that God. Y'all awake? Okay. Big shot. Then go sell everything you got and give it to the poor. Everything, not just half, everything you got, give it to the poor. Hello? And he said to them, Yet lackest thou what? One thing. Sell all that thou hast and distribute it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Come, what? Come and follow me. See, he didn't just say, if you sell everything you got, you're going to heaven. No, 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 no. He said, you sell everything you got, give it to the poor, and then follow me. Follow me. Follow me. Y'all awake? What the Lord is trying to show him is this. Is that even if you have kept these commandments in relationship to man, you haven't gone as far as me to. There is an external hindrance to your eternal life, and that is your money. This man has made his money the controlling factor of his whole life. For you, it might be something else. But for him, it was his money. It was the thing that controlled him, not God. You have to hear this. What is Jesus saying? If you're going to have eternal life, he's saying, I must be the one who is the controller of your life. Anything else that comes between you and God 
is a controlling factor in your life. And the Lord is showing you that he must be the controller of our life. Watch this. Listen carefully. The Bible says that, Jesus, uh, that Peter denied the Lord three times, right? He started that at the beginning of it. He denied the Lord three times. The word deny, the Greek, literally means to turn your back on, to reject, to deny, and walk away from. So when Peter denied the Lord, he rejected, denied him, and turned his back on him completely. Watch. When it says that you are to deny yourself, the same word is used that was used of Peter. When Peter denied the Lord, he turned his back on God. He walked away from God. He denied God. That's what Peter did. And then God said, you have to deny yourself. Peter disowned God, turned his back on God, rejected God, but he denied. The Greek word says, you are to deny yourself, which means you lose self only. So the same denial that Peter denied with when he turned his back on God and walked away from the Lord and disowned Jesus is the same denial that you and I must have. We must disown ourselves. I lose all control to my life. I disown myself totally. I make God the controller of my whole life. That's what it means. It doesn't mean I stop eating chocolate when I got Jesus. It doesn't mean I stop drinking beer when I got Jesus. That's, that's denying myself. Oh, I got to have my beer. I, and I'm a Christian now. No, I, but I'm denying myself is, you know, I'm a Christian now, so I don't drink anymore. That's not denying yourself. That could be a part of denying yourself. You stop drinking Cokes. Good for your health. Stop smoking. Good for your health. Getting saved. Stop drinking. Good. Didn't save you. Stop committing adultery. Good. Didn't save you. Ooh. It's a Bible word. Don't look at me like that. All the way. Didn't save you. Denial. Might include all of that, but denial ultimately is you have given up ownership yourself. But the only way that you can do that is if you've been saved. You can't do that without being saved. So in the light of the cross, you deny yourself, you disown yourself. Now, God becomes the controller of your life. And so this man, the controlling factor in his life was his money. It was keeping him out of heaven. But if he were to walk out that day and sell everything he got and give it to the poor, he would have still been lost if he didn't do the next thing. And that is follow Jesus and make Jesus the owner and controller of his life and make Jesus the savior of his life. He's saying, I must become the one who owns you. You need me. And you need to re get a revelation. I'm God. And I'm not just a good master, but I'm God. You just keep preaching. Look at your name and say, it's an impossible salvation. Do you feel it now? I mean, he's giving you one example after another. You know what I'm saying? It's impossible. It is an impossible salvation. Impossible. That's why, rich young ruler, you must get a revelation that I'm God. That's why you've got to be like a little child. 
you must be born again. You must know, like the publican, God must become the mercy seat. Without that, it's an impossible salvation. Even for a rich young ruler who said, I've done this, done this, done this, done this. Jesus didn't look at him and say, you're lying. He didn't tell that man, you're lying. He didn't say, no, you're lying. You didn't keep those. He said, okay, one thing you lack. Go sell everything you got and give it to the poor, then come and follow me. He didn't deny what the man just told him. Watch. But that man's still lost. In this passage. Y'all ready? <clears throat> and when he heard these, this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God. What did Jesus see? He saw this young, rich young ruler who had that external hindrance to eternal life called money in his life as the controlling master of his life. He saw this rich young ruler turn. Jesus did not see his face any longer. Jesus did not see his profile any longer. Jesus saw his back. And when he saw the back of that, brother passage says, oh, how he loved him. Oh, how he loved him. He saw that man turn his back on him. He no longer saw his face or his profile. He saw his back. And that man walked away from the only possible salvation is found in Jesus. Walked away sorry. It was too great a price for him to pay. His mind. He was not willing to pay that price. So now Jesus seized his back. Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful. He said, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God. Now watch, watch. If you think that giving up your money would have been enough, you're missing it again. It's an impossible salvation. You know what this man should have done? He should have fell at the knees of Jesus. And he said, um, it's impossible. I need you. I need God. I need you to save me. I've been saying, I've been saying, I've done this and I've done that. And you just said, I, I'm lacking one thing. Come on. Really what Jesus was trying to get him to do is to fall on his face before God and say, God, I need you. You're God. You're the only possible salvation. He's trying to bring him to the end of himself. Because Jesus said it, how hard is it for those? <clears throat> it's easier for a camel to go through the, a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. He didn't say it was impossible for the rich to go to heaven. Come on. He said, it's hard. It's like the camel going through the eye of a needle. Now, I don't have time. I've preached the deeper level of this to you before, the eye of the needle and what that means. I don't have time to do that today. Get the message. It's, it's on tape, okay? Um, that's impossible for a camel to accomplish. It's impossible for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Or somebody said, well, pastor, that's talking about that gate over in Jerusalem called the eye of the needle. No, they're just talking about a literal needle. Just like it's impossible for that huge camel to go through a little eye of a needle. Amen? With man, it's impossible for you to be saved. It's like the, a camel going through the eye of a needle. Salvation is impossible for man. They that heard it said, who then can be saved? And he said, the things which are impossible with man 
are possible with God. That's why, rich young ruler, you got to get a revelation of my Godness. You got to be like a little child. You got to be born again. You got to be like the publican who got a revelation. God must be become my propitiation. God must become my mercy seat. God Himself is the only one that can save me. It's an impossible salvation. Get it? With man is impossible with God. All things are, are possible. That means that it was possible for even that rich young ruler who walked away that day, it was possible for him to be saved the next day. Was he saved? I ask you today, was the rich young ruler saved? How many of y'all believe the rich young ruler was saved? Lift your hand. Okay, how many of y'all believe he was not saved? Lift your hand. You do not believe that the rich young ruler was saved. How many of you just don't know? You're on solid ground. <laughs> because the Bible just tells us what happened to him that day. Oh, pray to God, would to God, that he got a revelation of God in Christ hanging on the cross. Because Jesus didn't say he could not be saved, but it was impossible with man. But what's impossible with man is possible with God. That's the whole point of this whole chapter. It's not just fragmented events. It's showing you the desperate need of man. In fact, it's an impossible thing for you and I. Impossible. Impossible. Harder than, than a camel to go through an eye of a needle. Impossible with man, but possible with God. Are y'all awake? Why is it impossible with man? Because it takes the blood to save you. And it takes your blood. Now, I'm fixing to land this jet. Don't lose this message. I know you're tired. Don't lose it. The reason why it's impossible with man, salvation, is because Adam fell. And when Adam fell, he corrupted his blood. So the blood of man cannot save Man, my blood can't save you. But the blood that's in our veins cannot save. I can't save you. You can't save me. The blood of a man can't save another man because the blood is corrupted and the blood must be pure. It takes blood to save you and that blood must be pure. And because my blood from Adam is not pure, then it's impossible for Adam or man to be saved. By man. It's unbelievable to my mind. No, I'm going to back up. It's unbelievable and unimaginable to the unbeliever that man could be saved. Are y'all with me? Man can't grasp the fact if it, with his theories or his philosophy. I'm telling you, this is so heavy. It's so beautiful. Man. How can man be saved? With man, it's impossible. Because the blood that flows in us is corrupted, and that blood and blood must be pure. God operates in the realm of law. And number two, it can't be the blood of animals, which the publican got a revelation of. God be the mercy seat to me. Be the propitiation for me. It can't be the blood of animals because the Bible says in Hebrews. That it was impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to do it. Which means God said, no, I don't accept the blood of animals. It's impossible, impossible for men to say man. And impossible for the blood of animals to say man. Because God said, I refuse to accept the blood of bulls and goats. And it's impossible for angels to save you because angels are spirits and they have no blood they cannot die and they have no blood so angels 
So we have arrived to an impossible salvation. Man can't save you. Angels can't save you. Animals can't save you. God looked at all the species that he put in the universe and he said it's impossible. 